All right, so how many of you know about the Y2K bug? Yeah? What was the Y2K bug, anyone? Anyway, you can go. Kinda. Uh huh. Nineteen hundred. Yeah. So the Y2K bug was a bug that basically was present in a couple computer uh, computers. Um, it was related to the Y2K, um, and the idea here was is that so here's. Um, Here's a sign that suffered from the Y2K bug. Um, many a programs represented four di uh, digit years with only the final two digits, so 2000 was no different than 1900. Um, and so there was different things. Back up. Time is really hard, by the way. Um, we're going to get our first taste of time in a, in a couple weeks when we have to deal with writing a date validator, which checks is the date a leap year or not, or is it a valid date? Because uh, nobody here in this room knows how, re how leap years work. You think you do, but you don't. So, for example, uh, raise your hand if you think to the year 2000 was a leap year. Not a lot of hands, not a lot of confidence. 2000 was a leap year because it was divisible by four, right? That's the rule. Everybody knows, right? What about year 1900? Was that a leap year? No, it was not a leap year because that's one of the rules of a leap year. Years that are divisible by, uh, by 100 are not a leap year unless they're divisible by 400 as well. Yes, leap years are terrible. <laughs> Leap years are, every year that's divisible by 4 is a leap year, unless it's divisible by 100, in, in, uh, in which case it's not, unless it's divisible by 400, in which case it is. Yes? Is a leap year again? A leap year is a, is a year like this year, where you add an extra day to the year to make up for the fact that uh, the rotation of the sun around the Earth actually takes around 365 and a quarter days. So it takes 365 days to go around the sun, Right? Uh, that's what gives us a year, the revolution around the sun. It's what causes the seasons and all that. Go around the sun uh, once, that's a year. But it takes 365 spin cycles, so the Earth rotating, for that to happen. Except that's not exactly, that doesn't exactly match up. It's closer to 365 and a quarter days. So to make up, for, and so that led to some problems with like the dates, with like the season shifting and things not just matching up weather-wise. So uh, eventually the Gregorian calendar was, t was introduced which said that, hey, a year, not 365 days, 365 and a quarter. And the way you make up that quarter day is that every four years, you have a February 29th. Um, which adds to very interesting things if, you've been born, if you were born on February 29th because you get to only celebrate your birthday only once every four years. So um, better really cash in those presents. Um, so anyway, leap years are tough because that, again, it's not 365 and a quarter exactly because, but, but it's close enough for a couple of years. Then... Once you talk about centuries, it's not close enough. So every century is not a leap year, except for the uh, except for every fourth century, in which case it is. Um, if you want to blame someone, bl blame Pope Gregory the Sixteenth. I don't know which one it was. The, the whoever the Pope, whichever Pope Gregory, the Gregorian calendar was named uh, named after. It's his fault, obviously, and because obviously he personally had a hand in that. <laughs> So, anyway, back to the year, uh, why, the year 2000 problem. It was basically that we, is that storage space for computers was very limited early on, right? 
storage space for computer was fair was fairly limited early on but um so you know you couldn't store the whole date storing the whole date was expensive so store the last two digits obviously this compute this com program is going to be replaced in 10 20 years right and so by so no pro there will, won't be any problems with me storing these dates turns out we have a whole lot of legacy stuff because people because companies are cheap and don't like upgrading things because upgrading things is expensive because developers are expensive. So, um, and by the way, you may hear reports that there's a developer shortage out there. That there's not, we're not training enough computer science people. Not training enough people in programming. The only people you hear this pe from are people in the industry. It's not true. Because the caveat is, we don't have enough developers for the price we want to pay them. There's enough, there's a... <laughs> You're pro, you're pro, if, you, if you learn programming, you should demand more money for what you do. If you use programming, you should demand more money for, uh, for what you do because it's worth it. It's hard. Um, hard in the sense that basically it makes you want to bash your head against the wall because you, because you spent three hours missing a semicolon. But um, So anyway, similarly, the, the year 2038 problem is already affecting computers, which is the same thing as the Y2K, only basically it says let's store uh, many systems, Unix systems, store the year, the current date as the numbers of seconds that have passed since January 1st, 1970. So just simply every second that goes up, that number increments. That's how we know what time it is. Um, this is stored in what we call signed 32-bit integer. In other programming languages, this basically means that we store it in this binary number and we just simply increment it every so often. But as it gets higher and higher, eventually you're just going to run out of space because there's only so many digits, binary digits we can use. So eventually it will just roll back over. Um, and that apparently, as I read yesterday, is already affecting computers about basically how he's got a, ma a client who's got several pension funds and it crashed 20 years before the Y38 bug because the job stopped working because it was trying to predict stuff 20 years in the future. And basically they had, this is an error bigger than the severity one error. That's what severity X is. I need to fly you in this afternoon because it's affecting stuff. Um, and the issue was, um, let's see, the batch job, you know, the person who originally wrote it, wrote this program, had been dead for 15 years, and in which case the case uh, hadn't been employed by the firm for decades. The program was maybe a few hundred lines long, but it was written in a very old style programming computational efficiency over human readability. So in other words, it valued the fact that basically, hey, our computers written 20, 25 years, 30 years ago were pretty weak. They needed to basically, we needed to crank every bit of performance out of them, even if that meant the code was really indecipherable. And of course, they were zero test because testing wasn't a big thing back then. In other words, testing to see if things would crash. And so they tried to fix it, and long story short, cost them about one point, it cost about $1.7 million to fix that because the code hadn't been updated, and that code that had been, hadn't been updated hadn't run any tests. Expect more things like this to keep coming up um, over, over the years. So debugging doesn't just happen to basically people who are just starting out is kind of the point I'm getting. It happens to big established companies and has massive, you know, numerical penalties associated with it. Yeah, so the art of debugging is figuring out what you really told your program to do rather than what you thought you told it to do. That's what debugging is. Figuring out what you actually told the computer to do as opposed to what you thought you, maybe your computer's doing. Because remember, what I mentioned on Thursday. Your computer is an evil genie who will maliciously interpret your wishes. You want, you want 100 pounds of, you want, you want 5,000, you want, 
So you want $10 million? Okay, I'm gonna drop $10 million worth of gold on your head. Congratulations. You didn't specify where or, or in what form, right? So be careful with what you ask for. Um, the idea, so the idea of a computer uh, bug comes, comes back to uh, Admiral Grace Hopper, who I've mentioned, and hopefully you possibly have looked up. Um, and there's this tale about her finding a physical bug, a physical actual bug in a vacuum tube that was causing some issues. This is the uh, photo of, the, of said bug, the first computer bug. It was a literal bug that had gotten into the computer and was causing errors. So um, now it doesn't, doesn't involve cockroach or moth guts all over your computer, um, but it can be, as it says, it can be just as frustrating to figure out. Um, so let's see what, what our book suggests. So programming, and be sure to watch these videos. They're very good. They're, they, they are really good videos. Um, so the big thing is that we don't really teach debugging too much in computer science in a formal course because it's something you have to learn by making mistakes yourself because the reason for these things don't really become apparent until you've hit your until you've made the mistake um so thing is is that you need to under, you need to figure out what your problem is and the biggest thing for debugging that will help you is that you need to start small. Don't try to tackle the program all at once. And this is a big problem thing you're going to be have to work on, right? Don't tackle the program all at once. Problems that look big are overwhelming. Ever have to clean a really messy room? Sure you have. We've all been teenagers. Um, if you clean a messy, if in that room just looks completely overwhelming if you try to uh, do it all at once. But maybe you just start with the bed. Start with getting all, you know, t changing the sheets on the dirty bed, getting all the stuff off the bed, you know, and now at least the bed is clean. Then we move on to maybe some shelves, or maybe we move on to the floor so that we can put it. Maybe we just move the, all the stuff off, off one section of the floor and shove it somewhere else just for a bit. So we have room to organize. But you break down the problem into small parts is the point. So make small incremental improvements to your code. That is a big thing. Um, now, when you get errors, you will be basically be get, basically there are two ways that you can figure out what your errors are. So here's an error. This is called a syntax error. Um, now, syntax is not what it, now syntax in this case is not what we apply to cigarettes. It is instead a, a, a it refers to grammar. I thought that was a lot funnier than it was. So, so grammar here. So the syntax in grammar is a um, is saying that basically that there's something wrong with the way you've structured your statement, and unlike my, you know, unlike the relationship between me and my three-year-old, you know, when, when my three-year-old says, Daddy, get ball, his syntax ain't there. He didn't have the article, the, in there. Not, Daddy, get the ball. He said, Daddy, get ball. But I can put in the the mentally and get the ball, right? If your computer is, let's say, a bit more of a, does not like three-year-olds, uh, Right here, we save and run this, and we get an error. Syntax error. End of end of file in multi-line statement in line three. It says that basically that Python can't figure out what you were trying to say here. And if you spot it, it's a, we have this print statement where we opened a parenthesis, but we didn't close it. Very common mistake, by the way, to make. Once you ma you'll make this a couple of times. But first couple of times, you won't catch it. And once we fix that, it runs perfectly fine. Right? So generally, a syntax error is where, we, where, where some kind of grammatical statement goes wrong in Python. Okay, let's take a look at the next error that this book. Runtime errors. Which of the fall? These, so these are rare. These are exceptions because something exceptional bad and bad has happened. So let's go ahead and take a look at a runtime error. Uh, 
right? We didn't go over this, um, but let's go ahead and say five divided by zero. Zero division error. Runtime error. It's an error that happens when you're trying to run your code. It's not like something we could have caught beforehand like a syntax error. We tried to do it and it was a bad idea. For instance, and that can happen accidentally lots of times. Just make x equal to zero and divide by x. It tells me zero division error. That's some errors they, they get really specific, by the way. Makes you let let you know. He tried to divide by zero. Right? Because you can't get a really good answer for that. Although we divide 5.0 by x, float division by 0. OK. Uh, what if we divide 0 by 0? OK, what if we divide 0 by 0, 0.0? So it really doesn't want me to divide 0 by 0 in any way, shape, or form. OK. So semantic errors. So. These kind of errors are the are one of the worst because they're not errors in the sac in the fact that they crash your program. Here's a very simple one. Um, let's go and open up our our recently closed program. Let's go ahead and open up the the um, the currency file that we're working on. No, I clicked on the wrong one. Read some file. Okay. Read some files. That's swap with us. Here we go. So suppose over so some example of this is that if I accidentally put yen for both, that's perfectly valid. It's not what I wanted. Right? If I say in, if I both put out the United States if I say yen do, in dollars is equal to this, right? I'll say $28 and says that this much is equal to this much yen, which is obviously wrong, but my computer didn't give me an error or anything. This is a, and you can see that's because I changed the amount, which is the United States dollars amount, into yen. That's a semantic error. We get something wrong like that. Um, the issue here is, is, and this is where, and semantic errors are those evil genie problems where the computer did exactly what you told it to do. Okay. Finally, the last error that we look at is the type error, which basically, which we saw when we were trying to convert some inks to type. Here are the most common. Uh, here are the most common types. Um, syntax error, basically for getting parentheses. Very easy to, or a, or a quotation mark. Very easy to fix. Name error. Okay, that one, if I recall correctly, right, that is when I do something like this, x is not defined. So that's where basically you try to get a variable that doesn't exist. A type error, that's where we try to mis mix and match types. Value error, and that's basically, these are really the only ones that we'll be hitting. There's attribute errors, we'll be getting zero. Indentation error, we'll be getting into that more when, for instance, we um, deal with, in, when we have to indent stuff, when we make more complicated programs. Uh, index error, when we deal with lists. Time limit error, that's when, on, and you're not gonna see that too much outside of the textbook, because the textbook puts a time limit on the amount of time a code, the code can run. So, but syntax errors are the most common. Um, type errors are also very, very, let's see. Type errors occur when you try to combine two objects that are not compatible. For instance, when you try to add together an integer and a string. So let's see if we can't figure out what this Polish le uh, learner did. See if you can find and fit here. So input, input, don't understand, I don't know what this is in Polish. Um, aha, so he said int x int a, aha, this is the classic divide, figure out how many hours something is. So you took an x, took an a, h is equal to x divided by 24, enter the number of a, um, let's go with 100, 200, and then we get a type error on line 5. 
saying, hey, you can't take a string and an int together. But wait a second, we converted that x into an int, right? Well, yes, we converted it, but we didn't save it. Right? We converted it, but that does nothing. That doesn't change it. It doesn't actually change it to an int. Makes sense? We have to store what we change. If we make a change and we want to keep the change around, we got to store it. So that's a very common error you'll get, uh, that you'll get in your first couple of weeks. Yes? Is bad no, it is not bad practice at all. It is not bad practice at all. The only way I, I the only reason I avoid that, or, or try to avoid that early on, is because doing this looks a bit scary when you're just starting out. Excellent question. So this question is, can I can't I just do this? Automatically just convert it to an int as I'm taking it in? And the answer is, of course you can. The only reason I don't is because, at least for right now, I like to make my thing. I like to be expressive rather than concise in what we do. It's easy it's easier and more friendly to just start you know to start with simple sentences. Then we can move up to the harder stuff, right? You know, it's like in English. You don't start out by writing uh, by write, writing sentences and then using the semicolon off the bat. In fact, people tell you you should never use the semicolon because nobody uses it correctly. I use the semicolon all the time and nobody's yelled at me, so I guess I'm doing okay, or maybe people are just afraid to yell at me. All right, so debugging is, is a very valuable tool. The other big thing that you want to do when debugging and figure stuff, to figure stuff out is to use print statements. We'll be looking at unit testing, I hope, later in the semester. Just in, in other words, how to write automated tests to do something. I'll assign this section of the textbook um, because, honestly, debugging is not something that's particularly interesting on... At, in, in an intro class on its own until you learn a bit more and until you crash into a couple of the errors. Um, so let's talk about Python modules. So there's various ways you can write a program. Um, the first is to actually just write a script, which is what we do. Another way is to create a program that has a bunch of functions. Now, the great, this is possibly the greatest thing about Python, which is that it has a lot of stuff in Python uh, that are available for you. Uh, this is from XKCD. It's a great web comic. Um, a module basically has all these awesome functions that you can use. Um, right now, I'm going to focus on the math library in particular, but let's just go with the standard library in Python, sometimes called the stdlib standard. Uh, again, programmers are lazy. So what we'd like to do is that we, and programmers by nature are lazy, and we like to have a lot of things that are built in. Um, things that are built in, um, let's see. We have all these sorts of things over here. Uh, Built-in values, being able to ha handle bytes. So text processing services. Um, so remember how I mentioned that date and time is a pain in the butt, right? Well, there's a module for that to handle date, time, and other things to make sure that you don't have to think about how you have to handle date. Now, you thought the rules for leap, uh, leap years were crazy. Wait until you learn about leap seconds. You think I'm making a joke. I swear to God I'm not. I wish I was. A leap second. That is a one second adjustment that is occasionally applied to, your, to the universal coordinated time to accommodate differences in precise time and the imprecise solar time. Uh, that and that occurs because of weird stuff that happens like big earthquakes that will slightly adjust the timing of Earth rotation. Uh, and then Putting it in is a weird thing. Like here's the announced leap seconds we've had. Uh, haven't had any since 2016, so that's cool. Um, and now atomic clocks are being more there. Issues caused with in, with with uh, insertion of leap seconds. Uh, oh, 
and let's not just get and let's go back to something a bit more definite uh, daylight savings time can you make a program how, how in the world do you make programs to deal with daylight savings time don't use the built-in library it's like you know time travel's tough you know trying to program to account for it is tough so uh and we're only going in one direction for time, as far as time travel is concerned. It's still tough. Um, so there's all sorts of things that are built, built into their um, arrays. Um, let's see. Statistics, mathematical statistics stuff. Uh, things to interact with your operating system, like being able to make files and stuff. Um, dealing with certain different files. Generating random numbers for managing secrets, dealing with inter input output, dealing with threading, all sorts of stuff. Oh, um, handle stuff to interact with stuff on the internet, like email, or let's see, or creating your own server. You can run a server using Python. There's all sorts. Oh, and doing graphics. There's all sorts of things you can do with Python. Um, and the, it's got a giant extensive library. The big one that's possibly the most accessible is the mathematics library, right? Imagine I told you to write a function to, uh, sorry, write a program that would basically give me, given a number, would give me the sign of that number. That would be awful. I'm never going to make you do that. Instead, what you would do is say, wait a second, why should I do it? I'm not, I'm not an expert. I'm going to go to the math library, which has all these functions. So for instance, uh, the ceiling which is the smallest integer value that's equal, greater than or equal to this number. Or, um, ooh, here's a good one. Let's see, Python 3. Do it's the max function. This one's built in. It's not a ma math library, but the max function. Given like uh, four to, given a bunch of numbers, it'll tell me which one is the biggest. That's pretty cool. Um, Although it does lead some questions of uh, what in the world is the biggest if I give it A, B, and C. It tells me C is the biggest. Hmm. What? What is Z? Well, Z would be the biggest of those, although... What about capital C versus this? It's lowercase z is bigger. Um, and this has to do with the way that Python deals with, with uh, translate stuff. Um, again, these are stored. Remember, the computer considers everything to be uh, ones and zeros, but the way it handles this stuff is alphabetically. So the thing that's last alphabetically is z. And the thing that's first alphabetically is a. Right? So just like so... A, therefore, is smaller because it comes first, just like zero is the smallest because it comes first, right? And all the way to the end of Z. That's a bit of a lie. It gets more complicated, and we'll get into that, but it's an easy enough framework to think of, right? So although, uh, can we mix and match? No, it does not want me to mix and match at all. It says, uh, please don't. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of Python. There's a bunch of stuff that are built into Python that are really nice. Um, import math, and the way we do that is basically is that we can import something. Like, let me go in into an actual idle program. Um, let's see. Um, new file. Let's call this the square root curve. So this is a curve I sometimes use for things called the square root curve. Okay, the square root curve is a fairly strong curve in terms of score, as, and I don't use it very often. But the way it works is that you take your score, take the square root of your score, multiply it by 10, and that's your curve score. So. In other words, a 64, square root of that is what? 8 multiplied by 10, 80. Your new score is an 80. Doesn't help you if you get 100, right? Square root of 10 is 10. But anything less than 100, it bumps it up just a bit. 
So an 81 now becomes a 90. I use it for a couple of assignments in, um, in data structures. So how do I calculate such a thing? Well, in, well, first thing we're going to do is that we need that square root function. So we're going to import math to get access to all the mathematical functions that we need. And this is the way that imports work. Basically, there's a bunch of stuff that are built into Python. A, tol a whole lot of stuff. I think after this, the reason we introduced this is because I want to introduce turtles to you guys, which requires its own library. So, um, so we import math, and this gives us access to all the math stuff. Now you might be wondering, wait, if it's part of Python, why don't I have access to it in the first place? And that's because you have to make two choices when you're designing a programming language. The first is load a minimal subset of stuff, like the print function, into your language. Keeps the program small, but you have to import things, and then you have to know where the things are to import. The other option is import everything, but then all your program resulting programs are huge because they've imported all the libraries there. Um, importing them from where? From your disk. Um, and that, you know, so we want this to run on as many uh, systems as we need, and we want our programs to generally be as small as possible, so we only import what we need. So let's go ahead and do this. So um, original grade is equal to input, enter grade. I'll just keep it very simple here, enter grade. And then we'll turn the grade into an integer. Original grade is equal to int. And then copy and paste. So that allows me to deal with, with that. It knows that basically I don't get an error for, it doesn't really seem to do anything, just importing uh, uh, that by itself. So enter grade. Uh, Let's go with 81, right? It doesn't do anything because I haven't told it to do anything. So now I want to get the curved grade, which is equal to the square root which is equal to the square root of the grade uh, times 10. Now I can do the times 10 pretty easily, but how in the world do I do a square root? So let's go ahead and look at the math object and see if there's any square root. So there's i square root, non-negative integer, square root, math.sqrt, math dot squared, I guess, return the square root of x. So the way we use it, if it's inside a module like this, if it's in, we, what we've done is that we've imported math, we've added math to our program. And the way we can use the math library is that we say, we say math, the name of the library, dot sqrt to call that built-in command. So enter grade 81 and now it still doesn't do anything because I didn't tell it to do anything else. Print new grade plus str curved grade. Eighty one, new grade ninety point zero. Now, before we go and end the lecture, because it is getting to that time, I do want to talk about what the focus is going to be for most of the following lectures, which is turtles. Okay, so let's go ahead and sh and basically I'll create a new file over here. 
in our classroom folder, ITP. And I'll explain what I'm doing in more detail next uh, lecture. A lot of what I'm doing with this module, this is just previews for the upcoming stuff. Because really, turtles I find are a great way when you're beginning the program to really understand what it's doing because you get to see what the heck is going on as you're doing it. Um, first turtle. So the very, it's very important here, by the way, that when you're working with turtles, so this is possibly the most important thing I'm going to tell you over the next couple weeks. When you're working with turtles, never name your file turtle.py. And the reason for this is that your computer will then assume that that is the turtle file that we're importing from. You'll, I'll, I'll, I'll show you that later at some other time. So to use turtles, the first thing we do is we import the turtle package. Okay. And the next thing we do is that we want to create, we'll create our first turtle by saying turtle is equal to turtle dot turtle in all caps, I believe is the way it works. Let me run that and see if it works. Hey, it works. There we go. The first, and that's all we needed to do to create our turtle program. So it comes up with a window with a little arrow there. There's a lot of different things we can do with turtles, but we're gonna just um, we're just going to go ahead and um, I'll work on I'll work with him from here um, rather than from here, so you can control him. For instance, um, let's actually create, um, let me actually create somebody else. I want to give my turtle a bit more of a distinctive and shorter name, so I'm going to call him Bob. Say hello to Bob. He's going to be your best friend for the next couple weeks. So Bob is our turtle. And um, here's the, so let's tell Bob to do stuff. Bob.forward. 50, which moves him forward 50 pixels. And as they move forward and drew a line over there. What the heck is a pixel? More on that next on next lecture. We can make Bob turn. Bob dot left 50. Turn him 50 degrees to the left. Let's turn him 90 degrees total. Left 40. And now he's pointing up. It's probably very hard for people to see in the back, by the way. So let's go ahead and increase his size. Let's go with uh, library. Love being able to do this. Turtle.html. Okay. Uh, size. Pen size. Nope. Let's see. Shape. Turtle.shape. And turtle size. Turtle dot shape size. Okay, and let's go ahead and it's so first off, a turtle. So let's say Bob dot shape size to set his shape. Let's go with twenty twenty and see what that happens. A uh, turtle has no attribute shape size, so I misspelled it. I think I have to have it all lowercase. Oop, that's a bit too big. Let's go ahead and maybe do 10 and 10. What's that going to give me? Oh, again, shape size, 10, 10. That's a bit more, un that's slightly less unreasonable. So let's actually go with... Uh, Five, five. There we go. That's good, even for everybody in the back. And let's go ahead and actually, well, we said it's a turtle, so let's go ahead and make him a turtle. Bob dot shape turtle. You don't have to memorize all these commands quite, quite yet. These commands are just simply GUI commands right over here. Ah, there we go, a turtle. Bob dot forward 100. And basically, the way to imagine this is that we've got this turtle on a giant white piece of canvas, okay? And what he's doing is that he's got a little pen attached to his tail, okay? 
And as he moves, he, draw, he drags that pen along the canvas. To, and so he'll be able to draw stuff. So for instance, I, this pen metaphor is actually exactly what we use. So for instance, if I tell him to do pen up, and then if I tell him to move forward a bit more, moving forward 200 pixels now, notice that he didn't draw anything because he had his pen up. If I tell him to do pop.pen down, he'll put his pen down. Bob dot left. And let's turn him another 90 degrees. Fortunately, we're not dealing with radians or anything silly like that. Boom, he turns left. He can also go Bob, let's see, is it back? Let's see, back, 200. He can also go backwards, right? So you can have him move forwards, backwards, all that sorts of, all that nonsense, right? You can have him move whatever, however you want. So we'll learn more about turtles. The great thing about turtles is that it's built into the library we have, that into your textbook. So you can actually run turtle pro programs in your textbook. All right. And if you feel like you're going, we're going too fast, or you need me to tackle something else in a bit more detail, send me an email or come on and speak to me. Okay. I have office hours at four o'clock.